Uh, good afternoon. I noticed we have 86 participants and uh, quite a number of you were very punctual. Um, we thank you for making the time today. And we hope that, uh, as someone said, oh, apologies, let me. Um, we thank you for making the time today. And we hope that, uh, as someone said, we will not waste your ticket money. So um, my name is Alan Rokakopo. Um, I work um, in an electricity distribution company in Uganda called Umeme, where I head the legal, legal section. I am pleased to be a moderator and uh, to, to, to speak to you, to listen to um, the, the, people, the very experienced, very skilled people that, that, that the East African Law Society has invited to to share their knowledge, but I'm sure there's so many people here who, who, who have as much knowledge. So we're going to have a free flowing discussion where we expect that uh, any questions you have, um, any ideas that you'd like to share, we'll hope that we can have a conversation in a forum where everybody learns. Um, I would like to introduce, um, I don't know whether you need to turn on your cameras, um, but I'd be, I'd be happy to, um, I'll start with Ahenda. Um, I, hope, I hope you can all hear me. May I just get confirmation, especially from maybe a thumbs up or something that I'm not speaking to myself. Okay, good. So um, we have a very rich panel um, and, and we're covering um, areas you know, it's go from technology, um, you know, companies like Microsoft to banking, where they really take the lead in, in, in uh, AI, um, to, you know, government agencies, which are, which are very into safety. So um, it's very, it's my pleasure to introduce, um, uh, let me start with Ahenda. Ahenda and Gigi, um, we had agreed not to use many surnames, especially if you try to use mine. Um, she's a highly experienced in-house counsel. She's got an impressive 11 year career in the financial services industry. So she's been in banking, digital lending, payment sectors across East Africa. So she's the head legal and regulatory at Loop DFS, a subsidiary of NCBA Group. And this is a specialized unit um, that develops the FinTech arm of the NCBA Group. So she's, so she's right in the front seat in terms of developing uh, the technology. So she leads legal and regulatory strategic initiatives and uh, she's been dedicated, she's had dedicated experience in the fintech industry for almost for over eight years. Um, she's passionate in the progress and expansion of the industry, and she is, she is more or less established herself as an authority in shaping policies um, to support business growth and mitigate risks in the sector. Um, and uh, I'm, she will tell you, um, she's very active, she's looking to actively engage in creating an environment that encourages collaboration between industry players and regulators. So that, that is something that's very necessary for, um, for, for what we are discussing. Um, I would also like to introduce um, Salamani Kinyunyu. Um, Salamani um, is a lawyer with a broad range of African focused experience in policy, research, strategy development, um, advocacy, and outreach. So he's a government affairs lead for Africa at Microsoft, where he shapes Microsoft's strategy policy and regulatory agenda in Africa to address, and he addresses complex governmental and business priorities. Um, he's got a, a law degree from Tumiani University and an LLM from University of Western Cape. And then he also has an MBA from the University of Warwick. Um, I would like to also um, introduce Mr. Ridwan. Um, who, Ridwan is an assistant director at Center for Law and Innovation, and he is leading the professional development workflow. So he he's, has a lot of experience in global countries across Africa, Europe, and the Middle East, um, covering areas like that, data protection, artificial intelligence, governance, regulatory intelligence, digital ethics, and technology policy. So he, before he joined SATA Foundation, he founded Tech Hive Advisory, 
which is a technology policy and advisory research firm with a footprint in Africa and Europe. Um, he holds a master's in law and technology from Tilburg University, Netherlands. He's a certified information privacy professional in European data protection law, a certified information privacy manager, and a trained artificial intelligence governance professor, professional uh, by the International Association of Privacy Professionals. So he's organized policy hackathons, has facilitated international certification based capacity building sessions, um, and you know, for both private and public sector. And he's, you know, and senior leadership in global co corporations. And this has um, led to enhancing the capacity in artificial intelligence, governance, data protection, in surveillance, um, among other things. Um, Brian, um, Brian Mwindi, um, I like the letters F-C-I-A-R-B, is a fellow, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Just one second. Um, sorry, Brian, I need to pull in it. Just so, um, so Br Brian is, uh, give me a second while I get his profile. Um, so Brian is the, as well as a FET fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitration, um, and he's a partner and head of corporate and commercial at Triple OK Law Advocates. And if you know Triple OK, you know, they're very, Cutting edge, they're always at the head of some of these things. So um, I'd like to let you know that you're all in good hands uh, and uh, we need to get started. So we're now two minutes beyond our 10 minutes. So um, we're going to have a conversation. I would like to um, encourage you to ask as many questions as you can. Um, we'll start with asking questions in, 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 the, in the chat, you know, you can please type some questions either in the Q&A and the chat, and we will try our best within the time that is given to us um, to get as many questions answered. Um, so um, I'm now going to let you hear from um, everyone else in the room except myself. I've taken 10 minutes, um, and, and I'm, I'm glad that you're here. Let me just say thank you once again, and uh, we're going to get started with our questions. So um, I'll start with... Uh, with, with you, Ahenda. Um, and we noticed that ChatGPT, or actually we'll, we, everyone talks about ChatGPT, but AI is a lot more than ChatGPT. And, and um, I would like you to just you know, tell us about uh, um, your experience in terms of awareness and use of the tools and what you think um, um, the, the ChatGPT and AI generally um, can do for us. Um, thank you so much, Alan, for the wonderful intro. And it's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. I think I'm going to speak from the context of an in-house council. Um, as in-house council, we are always charged to be of value to the business. So when I think about AI, I think about productivity, I think about efficiency, and I think how best can we utilize um, AI and other um, aside from chat GPT and, uh, you know, language models um, in terms of just um, increasing efficiency for the team. And um, I know this may be a, a different perspective from um, external counsel and, you know, running a law firm, but for in-house counsel, I think when you speak to your business leaders and when you're presenting your strategies for the year, I think one of the most painful conversations we usually have as in-house counsel is to be not only a cost center, but a business enabler. So for me and my experience and what we're trying to drive in the team is actually even looking at ways of uh, process automation and automizing, um, automating, sorry, um, workflows. Um, for example, contract review, um, if we have to do legal opinions, and I say this carefully because um, we all know the ethos and I think this will come up in, in some of the conversation that we are going to have this afternoon in terms of just um, drawing a delicate balance between utilizing the tools to optimize efficiency and productivity, as I've said, and just being able to govern the tools to, towards um, being actually useful in the way that they are meant to be and not to be you know, misused. So for me, I think one is to just um, increase the speed, increase uh, productivity and efficiency. And this is not only in terms of language models like um, ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot or BARD, 
but also just to utilize the other tools in terms of, um, like I said, process automation, workflow automation. Are we able to also utilize these tools to actually, you know, um, you know, in terms of legal ops? How are we able to show, like, for example, data analytics? Am I able to to optimize the team's efficiency and and be able to have a conversation? Say, for example, with my finance team and say. I need to um, say have a raise or, or 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 even bonus conversations by demonstrating using AI that actually the legal team has delivered on strategy, and the legal team has also delivered in terms of being a, a business enabler. I think that those are some of the things that uh, immediately come to mind. Thank you very much. Now um, I know the in-house counsel is usually lately the the target legal operations, uh, you know, they said, let's, let's mark it to them. Um, Brian, if, if I may come to you, um, from the law firm perspective, um, what do you think, what are your thoughts, um, especially with regard to um, use of legal tech um, to meet your objectives um, and, and whether the cost is worth, is what is, is whether, whether it makes sense financially um, to, to use AI? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Alan. I'll just pick up from where Henda left off. Um, and as she says, for, for in-house, the key is making sure that, you know, you use data analytics for legal output strategy. When it comes to practice, um, where we have seen a lot of lawyers using AI will be to try and fasten the, either the review process. So, for example, when it comes to contract review, um, one of the things that you can do with AI, and I know whenever we talk about AI, everyone just automatically uh, leans to chat GPT, um, but I will speak to AI in general. <clears throat> there are a lot of processes out there that you can use to, to look through and identify key terms in contracts, but there's a danger to a council relying on that and simply put in, for example, um, say it is a big construction and construction is why you see this because construction contracts will be, you know, they can run into 700, uh, 800. But if you use, for instance, the standard ones, whether it's your JCT building or it is your FIDIC contracts, there's a temptation to extract certain keywords and then use GPT to simply um, you know, GPT or any other AI to simply search for those key terms. Now, that obviously is not uh, going to be assistive in, in the, you know, in the long or short run. And you might find that you have to redo the work that you're doing because all that the AI does currently, and I know there's a lot of uh, growth in this sector and we have some people from Microsoft who can talk a bit more into this. All it does is it just simply looks at the language, uh, the way that it appears. It does not look at the context. It does not understand the nuances. For example, when you talk about practical completion. So you may have a term that yes, it will identify the term, whatever it is, the same way you can do that on Word, but then you find that the use of that term is not the way that the computer has picked out for you. But the more, the bigger um, takeaway, I think for, for lawyers, whether they're in-house or not, is GPT and all these AI functionalities only make you better? So you must know your content by the time you're using your AI. So you use AI to make things faster for you, but you don't use it to give you answers. You don't use it to, you must know your subject. Uh, you must be a subject matter, not really expert, but knower. So have your knowledge and then it will give you, um, I can give you an example. Um, I once asked GPT to, to explain to me what real estate investment trusts are um, and what is a DRIT and an IRIT. <clears throat> and I think I told a number of you, they, they said a DRIT is a domestic RIT and IRIT is an international RIT, which is completely incorrect. It should be development and income. So if you do not know and you simply pick it and run, then you get into issues. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, I think we all had that story about the, the lawyer who, who, who made submissions and they found that there were fictitious cases that he was quoting. Um, I, I, I thank you, Brian. You mentioned um, discussing, calling people from um, Microsoft to say a bit more about it. Uh, I'd like to go to you, Selemani. I think you are the one that we were referring to. Um, while we, this conversation was happening, I just realized that many of us, me included, um, do not know um, how wide the concept of, of AI is, especially in terms of what it can do. 
Um, I would like, to, you know, you work with Microsoft and this, you know, in just conversations before this, um, I know there's a lot more you can tell us about it. Um, kindly let us know what you think the, the, the breadth of, of AI is and what options we could have in terms of practical application. Thanks so much, Alan, uh, and, and thanks to ELS for inviting um, us to this conversation. Um, really great question, and I think a good question to sort of like level set, right? So when we are speaking about AI, there are various forms of AI, um, and I'll not go into them right now, but just to say there are different types of artificial intelligence. What people are mostly talking about today is generative AI. Um, which is obviously based on, as Brian mentioned, the ability for computers and algorithms to learn from large volumes of data, particularly language, to then understand patterns and trends. So that's essentially what um, generative AI is, is in, in very, very simple terms. It's the, the scientists and technologists will explain it in a lot more um more complex way, but essentially it's that. The, the, the computers, the supercomputers look at this data, they understand patterns, and that's why they will know a certain word will go best after another word. Um, so generative AI, the capabilities that we are talking a lot about now today, chat GPT, which uh, is run by OpenAI and a partnership with Microsoft, Microsoft's Copilot, and then um, Google's Bard or Gemini, essentially, are AI capabilities that run off large language models and they can do a number of things. They can um, basically analyze text, they can summarize text, they can develop drafts of text, uh, engage in analysis or certain trends based on information that is fed into it. But in addition to that, most of us has, have been engaging with, for example, ChatGPT or Google's Bard, you can also, these generative AI systems also have the capabilities, because it's language, again, to generate video, to generate audio, um, images, texts, video, et cetera, and even voice. So for example, people a couple of months ago heard about um, a very famous singer who's um, voice was manipulated with, with using an AI tool, and it sounds exactly like um, that 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 singer. So that's what generative AI can do specifically. Now, if we look into the future, um, AI will be able to other forms of AI will be able to do a lot more. Um, and actually, we are seeing uh, a lot of learning happening within um, AI AI platforms. And why is that specifically relevant for uh, lawyers and in-house counsel specifically? Our jobs, our roles, uh, lawyers essentially, we trade in language. And what these tools have been able to do is to master the art of understanding and communicating in a way that has not been done um, ever before. And that's why you know, these tools are so captivating. It's the ability to manipulate language, uh, and to do it in a very quick um, quick manner, but not just language, as I said. It also has capabilities for you know, video, audio, and uh, to generate images and text. I'll, I'll stop there for now in case there are any additional questions. Thank you very much. Um, I already see questions coming in. Um, thank you. Please keep them coming. Um, I think I'm going to go to read one now. Um, in terms of uh, the use and application of uh, AI, um, is it is AI a facilitator? Is it disruptive? Um, every lawyer was asking last year, am I going to be re made redundant by AI? Is there going to be a robot that will do my job? Um, what do you think uh, the impact of AI is or could be on our practice? All right. Yeah, thanks for that, Alan. Uh, I think for me, one of the key things you need to think about as as, as professional is first, um, what we know certainly for now, and even from like the use cases that many of us already deploy, many of these generative AI tools for is uh, we're going to automate faster. We're going to be able to also scale some traditional things that will take like a long time to do. So what that simply means is that if we hire people in the capacity to do this 
really now an autonomous thing. So I think you are now um, that are now being automated. Um, it simply means those functions may not be so needed. Um, because for me, for example, someone can put up a first draft of something for me, and I'm basically asking it, you know what, take this context into consideration and do this for me. And that will give me a better data that maybe an associate will do for me, for example. So, but what I think about is, is AI is not, as much as, as innovative as it is as a solution, um, it's also very important for us to acknowledge the fact that we've seen different evolution of technologies and yeah, with every yeah. new technology, there have always been like the whole conversation around whether it's taking our jobs and, and all of that. So for me, I think about it more from an argumentation point of view. I can find AI as an ally rather than see it or think about it as a competitor. Um, nobody's coming to take your job, but it means you may need to just step up. Yeah. Um, there are things that um, it takes you like forever to do and in an extremely short time. You can have like a draft of something, you can have something with framing properly, something, um, content, raw text, for example, into context, into, um, for more conciseness, more than you will do at the speed which you currently do it. So again, I, I think about it more like an ally rather than, I, I, again, I think about it more from a place of documentation rather than um, displacement and all of the, you know, existential conversation we've been hearing uh, we're not near close to that yet, um, and we need to face our reality. We need to skill up. We need to we need to do more as lawyers, um, both um, from an in-house point of view, also even for those who see the commercial um, commercial side of things. Uh, one thing I'm also going to add in terms of um, thinking about AI doomsday, and you know, I, I in, in 2020 I was part of folks who contributed to a, a book um, called Fake AI. And what we basically did with the book was trying to talk about different use cases of when you know AI overpromise as a solution, and people will also sell and advertise it, and matching it with the reality of what these tools are actually capable of doing currently. So, so, so many of the scaremongering that we get, um, it's not near that capability yet. Maybe it can get there or not. It's a different conversation. Uh, but what we need to ask ourselves is currently how are we using it? I, for one, I typically ask people, don't ask it what you have no idea about. If you don't have an answer, don't ask it. Because it's capable of throwing up interesting responses. You know, I don't want to use the word hallucination that people use in different contexts because it simply means attributing um, human capability to it. Um, but we've been able to find it as an ally to be able to get so many things done. Whether you want to review, whether you want to critique something, whether you're looking for loopholes in something, whether you need to account for more perspective that um, you're currently not looking at whether you need to do things um, at a scale and also at a speed where um, the current situation may not afford you. So let's think about it, leverage it more like, uh, like uh, something that can help us argument what our current capabilities, rather than thinking about it as something coming to displace us, coming to disrupt. Of course, it's disrupting. But then your job is not going anywhere. It's not going to replace some of your human innate capabilities. But it also means you leveraging it, finding it as a light, and that's something that will give you a competitive edge above everyone else. Exactly. Thank you very much. Um, it's an interesting uh, idea you have started in terms of uh, um, AI as a tool. Um, before before I go into one of the questions I want to ask, maybe let me let me get Gloria, um, uh, who you know, when Rwanda is one of the places where where um, the use of IT, the sort of uh, early adopters in terms of, of IT solutions. Um, Gloria, I'm going to co-opt you on this one, um, and ask in the banking sector, and and this will probably also segue into Ahenda's. Um, what how how dominant is is ai um, and and you know technology and uh, is it something that you think has now taken over and you can't work without it i don't know whether you can hear me gloria either gloria or henda you know you could take that sorry henda maybe yeah. Ahenda, maybe take that too um, yes, um, I, I think where we are, especially coming from an area that is disruptive in fintech, we cannot do without AI. I think I, I no, I think I actually do agree with my fellow panelists that 
um, AI is a tool that is an enabler. If I think about financial services and getting financial services from from the business to consumer, for example, in a B2C business, I think one of the critical aspects is being able to map out that customer journey very well, getting intimate with your customers and being able to deliver the services that the customers are actually asking for now. With human intervention, that is very limited. And I think once you use um, this generative tools and AI, it enables you to get to touch points that uh, a manual process is not able to. I'll give an example. If, um, you know, banking services nowadays, it's very easy to get um, to get assistance from a chatbot uh, as opposed to walking to, say, for example, a, a banking hall that may not be available, you know, after hours or very early in the morning. And you're also able to actually get responses faster than you would have if it was a human being helping you. So I think there's a delicate balance, like I said earlier, and we, we should look at um, some of these tools not as um, completely disruptive or, or, or like, like I can say, too, too new age for us to conceptualize in our minds. But I think it's something that we need to get used to adapting to. Because um, in the next, say, 20 or so years, a lot of our processes, a lot of our systems are going to be automated. So I think I go back to the to the saying, you know, adapt or die. At some point, we need to get used to be able to and comfortable enough to use these tools because getting comfortable also means we move into the area of governance, which I think is another area that we need to talk about. And I think it was Rigan who talked about the hallucination theory when it comes to um, generative language models and uh, and how we need to be able to govern these tools, not to lead us at, astray and even just have some of the issues that we've been having um, come up in the past uh, two or so years when it comes to AI and some of the generative model tools that are becoming very popular in our workplaces, very popular even in our personal spaces. So I think it's high time we continue having these conversations and getting used to the idea of um, of, of getting to the space of using AI. Thank you, Henda. Um, there's something interesting. Um, someone once referred to us lawyers as uh, the last medieval guild. Um, and, and you'll find there's a lot of mistrust, especially with regard to technology. Um, and my question is going to come from, you know, Timothy Amerit um, made a comment and then asked the question, uh, which is very, very pertinent. So I, I, maybe let me read the comment first and then read one. This question is going to you. Um, so he first said, there's sometimes a drastic variation in content in the diverse AI tools to any given inquiry. inquiry. Um, and in the absence of published literature for verification, it's hard to know the ideal information to rely on. How would I use AI? Um, to authenticate or bridge a gap in the diverse views generated by various tools. But I have a second question from Timothy again, um, which, 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 which I, I wanted to actually start with. Um, and this one also maybe deals with the academic areas or um, you know, the things that made the, the president of Harvard lose her job recently. Um, say, how do we embody and foster ethics and avoid plagiarism? while embracing AI in text writing and research. So both on the research and on the, the functional um, aspects, uh, please please, let, please uh, share your thoughts on that. So I think, you know, one thing that is certain is um, the whole world is coming to grasp with the fact that we can ban generative AIs. So rather than, you know, tell employees, don't use it, um, we don't, we prohibit it. I mean, they end up, using it some way. So I think it's more about thinking around what are like the governance structures we can put in place around um, the use of generative AIs. And I'm going to speak about the whole governance spectrum pretty much later, um, whenever it gives me opportunity to do that. But to answer the question about the quality of contents that you get, of course, um, these tools are trained distinctly. So sometimes you realize that you ask the same question and you get um, different responses, some more contextual, some also um, lacking like the context that you need. It just feels like you're reading something that is completely out of script. But what you also understand is um, with every model that is being introduced and with every update that is being made to these models, um, they tend to also get better. So one thing for sure that I always say is don't go asking it something you have no idea about. The job of verifying accuracy and the authenticity of seems solely rests with you. So 
there's an interesting case of a lawyer, for example, where, I mean, we're probably all familiar with the case who cited some cases that Generative AI made up, and those cases never existed in the first place. So again, I think about it more, like a collaborative tool than something I'm going to rely solely on. And if you bring this conversation back to even existential framework that we have in place, like data protection, for example, um, if you look at so many data protection laws across the continent, we typically find the right to um, automated based processing, you know, that extend outside of human intervention. So what the law presumes there is, in as much as you're leveraging fully automated based processing, you still have a role to play as humans in making intervention. Think about the context of things like content regulation, where a whole lot of platforms are now deploying AI tools with content moderation. There's still always the human intervention that gets into the loop. Think about things like credits, where um, now we're automating um, who is eligible for credits by combining different data sets that gives us like a picture Forget about the fact that sometimes the models in which these tools have been trained upon could sometimes be flawed. Because again, if you're bringing in a tool that, for example, was trained on a data set that simply applied to white male population in a rich, um, that, that, that looks at a rich demographic in probably a very rich country, for example, and you bring them into African context, there's a very good chance that a whole lot of people will be excluded. So again, the job of accuracy, the job of being able to verify what you're getting, C to E which is why you can solely trust these tools. Again, they're only there to help you. You know, you can ask it to reframe something for more contextual purpose. You can ask it to do like a first draft of something, you're playing with an idea and like, you know what, fleshing this up for me. But again, that's why, you know, there's this whole thing about human in the loop. So when we get to the governance conversation, there's a whole universe of conversation around, um, so, 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 because again, um, you know, Alan, you talked about Harvard plagiarism in academic world. We're seeing a lot of, because folks in the academic world are also getting the grasp of it. And I'll give you some really relevant examples because um, I was reviewing a paper for um, Cambridge recently. And one of the things they required was if you use generative AI at some point during the work, you must disclose it. And when we get into the conversation around governance as well, we talk about the role of disclosure. Now, we are having folks in the academic world who now also leverage tools, AI tools, to check if academic contents have also been developed through AI. And what the data is showing us is that these tools are also flawed. Because a lot of students, for example, who are not native English speakers, typically their paper gets flagged for plagiarism. When they may have never used AI. So um, I'm sure many of us, especially for those who have like a stint in the academic world, you know Turnitin. Turnitin has like an AI inbuilt tool that helps you verify, that it verifies like a paper if any generative AI tool has been used to create a portion of it. Again, what the data out there is showing us, no matter how much of accuracy these tools promise you, is that they can also be flawed. Context is typically missing. So again, back to what I've said. Verifying authenticity, verifying accuracy, whether that source was made up, was cooked up, never existed, sit with you as a human in the loop, which you must always do. Again, you can't fully trust um, fully automated tools to do human level of accuracy. So it sits with us. Uh, that, that's, that's my view on this. Thank you very much. Um, so no one can blame the, ro the robots. Um, uh, this, is, this is very helpful. Um, Ridwan, you said something that has brought me to a question, a cluster of questions that I'd like Brian to answer. Um, and it's a question on re relevance. Um, one question from Mr. Michael Mushi um, is, can we have the genuine AI that does not create irrelevant information? And then the next from, from Mr. Justin Semuyaba, um, who said, can you recommend chat GPT version specifically for legal analysis. Um, I think those questions point towards the relevance of ChatGPT. Is it just a shiny toy that you know everyone uses to, to look cool? Um, or is it something that can have some practical application? And is the use in practical terms? Um, do you think it's relevant now or are we just early adopters who are just trying to fit uh, you know, within the ChatGPT box when we probably don't even need it just now? Um, maybe expand that to cover AI generally. Thank you. Okay. 
thanks thanks alan um so let me share my screen very very briefly for this um and alan you can tell me if you can see it your your microphone is on mute alan but you... i can i can see it now yes, it's yes. Fantastic. Thank okay you. So in fact, let's we'll just do a very quick uh, demo. So I took the questions. I had presumed that those questions would come. So I have just extracted the question as it appears on the chat. You'll see it at the top there. And so that's the question that you are asking me to address. Um, and what I have done is first, I just want you to see if you take out uh, any question, anything that you want, there's someone else who spoke about, um, I think Roselemani, about how you have to implement, the way you ask the question will determine how it gives you the information you want. So look at the, you don't need to read everything that it says, right? But the question is just, can we have the genuine AI that does that does create relevant information? And then look at the next search term. If you look at the top there, there are a few things that when you do, when you use, it helps to make your answers a lot better. If you look at the answers that are here vis-a-vis -vis the previous one, so here you see what it's talking about, your quality of, of training, advanced algorithms and models, but it's not very relevant to you as, as in-house. It's not relevant to what you're doing. If you ask it, for example, look at the, the term, the difference in the search term at the top, to firstly make an assumption. So these are some of the things and you can now write this down. You will use this in any use case that you have. The things that give you the better um, quality answers are telling the, the if you're using AI, uh, chat gpt or any other things like assume making assumptions so assume you are this so assume you are an expert assume that you are um, a pa to uh, a legal advisor assume that you you work in this industry assume that so the assumptions are the very first thing you do before you give it whatever query you, you want and then the use so this is for example this is to a lawyer in east africa so this is literally just a few seconds ago um you know just put it in just for purposes of showing the, the examples of, um, uh, you know, how you use it. It doesn't have to be legal specific. So I don't have to go and find AI for legal. There are certain tools that you can use. So for example, when you go to, if you use ChatGPT, if you go to the top, when you open at the top there, it tells you use 3.5 or use 4 or use. Um, so the first thing is if, if you want to use it for, um, you know, everyday use, I would recommend that you, whatever platform you use, whether it's ChatGPT or Microsoft products or any others, uh, the, the premium product, which is the one that is paid for. So if you pay Microsoft or you pay um, uh, OpenAI to get, so when you pay, you get, now for, for ChatGPT, you get 4.0. 4.0, when you look at the very top on the right uh, you will see it has a number of plugins. Now, previously, I think last year, this section is, you know, it keeps advancing so fast. Last year, you could not, uh, you had to download and enable a number of these um, uh, plugins. Now they're all, as a matter of, you don't need to plug in anything. It all comes, uh, all built in. So if you want to achieve the best, once you click there, just check and see what, is more tuned because what happens is every other software developer or software um, language model expert is busy writing, um, uh, you know, data strings that are going to enable this, um, enable one maybe extract images, another one extract text from PDF, another extract, you know, and so on. So you find the one that is relevant, right? And once you find it, sorry, let me just stop sharing this. Once you find the one that's relevant, um okay there we go stop share once you find the one that's relevant you use that and you keep improving now most people will use gpt and assume or any ai that you'll ask it a question and it will give you a satisfactory answer that's not true you will spend um so say you were taking an hour and a half what it is meant to do is to reduce that hour and a half not to mean that you will just do just the one search so do not look for one that is specific to legal Depending on how much information or, or how IT aware you are, then you can go into, you can fine tune it yourself. Um, but I think that is a slippery slope unless, you know, you really get excited with this sector uh, because then you can go and you see, you can download if you use a, a, either a Mac device or a Windows device. 
Um, you can go into your terminal and you get it to, you know, you, you write a script there for it to follow. But that is if you have IT um, knowledge. If not, you don't need to bother with all that. All you need to do is improve how you use whatever AI tool you use to do uh, the function that you uh, you use it for, whether it's for your contract, whether it's to answer your queries. As I said, look for those key terms, the assumptions that you're an expert, you're an expert in this sector, explain, um, you know, for this. Those will make more of a difference than trying to find one which is specific. Are there such tools? Absolutely. Um, in our firm, we use uh, a number of AI tools. For example, on Lexis, there's a DMS uh, document management system platform, which uh, allows you to draft a contract by just putting in a number of, so for example, it's a shareholders agreement. Standard template shareholders agreement, you put in a number of things, the parties, the address, the notice, the dispute resolution, the boilerplate one, it generates your first draft. Then you can go and you can tweak it, you can make it a bit more. There's other ones that we use as well, uh, but those are more management, document management, rather than um, enabling you to query um, you know, the document. They will help you just to be more efficient. So for example, you can use another one to help you change all the, the styling and change all the formatting in our document. So you still have to do the work and then you will do a bit more um, you know, you will do a bit more in terms of now training. So you have to train it the same way that you train dogs. You have to train whatever AI tool you use. So the more you train it, the better it is. And I would say if you have, for example, one which is, is Q&A based, so you ask a question, it gives you an answer like GPT. You don't remain on the same chart and you keep asking it questions, right? So you go with this chart. Once you have got to a point where you're happy, you take that last line. Now you start a new one. It forgets, technically it's, it's not forgotten, but you start this new line of query. So I would say, let's move away from finding, I'm sure they will come and maybe that's a business idea for you to bring one that's legal oriented specifically. Um, you will have to address issues like, you know, um, liability, copyright and so on. The better thing is to learn to train it and then you will get much better results. Thanks, thanks Alan. Uh, thank you, Brian. I think that's what Moses is talking about, where he says uh, that you need to command prompt the AI system. Um, but there's a, a question that came in in the Q&A that I found um, would have come from me, but but it was asked much better. Um, you know, we lawyers either have a mistrust for AI or we have very high standards. So he said he first makes a comment and then um, Selimani, this is a question that's going to come to you after this comment. He said, sorry, but what's the point of a skewed AI tool? that I need to comb through or fact check. I already do that. So we should have fit for purpose tools. Um, but it gets, that is a question on relevance, but it also uh, gets me thinking about the duty of care. So it says, if there's misinformation from say a chatbot or any kind of AI, who can I sue? Who is responsible? So this goes to you, Salamani. Thanks, really, really uh, interesting questions. <clears throat> I think just to reiterate, um, the sentiments that where we currently are uh, with the vast majority of the tools that we have, these necessitate human intervention. So you have to either understand how to prompt the system adequately to get the right sort of response, but you also have to be able to review the information um, that the um, system generates for you to verify its, its accuracy, right? And that's why for us at Microsoft, we call our solution co-pilot. Um, it's there to assist um, the user in aiding their work in aiding efficiency um, and, and, and efficacy. Now, lots, lots of questions around um, you know, liability for um, the information that's produced. So let me just say, I think this is a, it's a question that's still sort of working its way through a number of jurisdictions. Uh, there's a broad range of, of, of cases that have been initiated in a number of countries, um, particularly the US, when it comes to liability, both copyright liability, but also liability for inaccuracies as such. It's, it's a very difficult um, question to answer specifically as to where the liability lies, because again, the system has 
the user has inputted a question into the system, right? So you have inputted some um, narrative into the into the system, and it has subsequently generated um, a response. Um, those responses are based off uh, data that has been gathered from other sources. So if you have sources that are inaccurate or you have sources that are incomplete, um, the system will use what what it has essentially, right? So it's it's a it's quite a complex um, question to unravel. And I think what we're seeing currently is an understanding that um, at least when it comes to 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 copyright, uh, who owns a copyright, um, that's shared. Right. Um, and for us as Microsoft, for example, with our solutions, um, we have for our enterprise, for our larger, for, for consumers who are using our, our co-pilot resources, we have taken on the obligation to say, if you receive, uh, uh, if you are litigated against based on your use of our system, we will stand in for you in, in your stead. Um, so we have, we have assumed that, that, uh, we've we've taken the the obligation to assume that liability in in the courts in the court processes. Now, I think the final thing just to 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 mention, I think, when it comes to thinking about artificial intelligence and the sort of systems that exist, why we can't have you know specific systems that are particularly tailored to. Um, for example, the legal field, or for you know, to have very specific legal tools, these systems are very, very expensive to build. Right, um, you need to have, um, you know, loads and loads of data to be able to first train your model for you to be able to understand that, and behind all that training uh, ability, you need massive amounts of computational uh, data. So, you know, this is why we are seeing pretty much the larger companies, uh, technology companies taking the lead um, on artificial in intelligence uh, use and the generation of um, some of these uh, Gen AI systems. That being said, I think what we will see going forward is um, the ability to leverage um, existing AI systems to do different things differently, right? So. Uh, open AI, for example, which is a foundation that created uh, ChatGPT, has uh, essentially opened up its system to developers to, to create essentially plugins uh, to be able to utilize the system. So you're still running on the on the open AI backend, you're still using its, its models, but to then generate uh, different types of applications for different types of uh, uses. Um, and so that's kind of an, an existing uh, limitation that is there. And then one final thing also to mention, when you're using a lot of these systems, um, be mindful that sometimes if you if you do put in information, these are not, they're not closed loops, right? So if you're putting in confidential client information, unless, for example, you're using um, a system or an offering that has guaranteed that, um, your data will then also essentially feed the system, right? Um, unless it's a closed, unless you're you're operating in a closed loop um, system. So just to be mindful of that as as we continue to use this for um, our work, um, that there could be some implications for for our clients and our end users. Thanks. Um, just allow me to thank everybody who's asking questions. You're making my work much easier. Um, and now I have two questions that I think I'll send to Ahenda. Um, in terms of your practical use, I, I know you've built tools and uh, um, in terms of the process, understand, understanding the process and creating tools to make your processes easier. Um, Mr. Samuyaba and uh, Mr. Muhire ask, uh, is there an, some, some kind of AI application that is suitable for analysis of large volumes of uh, especially legal documents, um, for instance, cases. Um, and then Mr. Mihiri also asks, can you recommend an AI application or software specifically designed to review contracts? Um, I, I think maybe um, 
good one, you, uh, Brian, you might also chip in on that one. So this is really a question of practical application of, of AI. Yeah, um, um, thank you for that question. I think um, Brian may have touched on this. I think we haven't gotten to the point where we have developed specific AI tools for, for the actual legal work that needs to be done, whether it's in-house or for external counsel. I think what I, I will just emphasize what Brian had spoken about in terms of, um, of just generating enough and adequate information for your AI to be able to generate in the information that you need in terms of what you feed it and what the expected output may be. So we haven't got to the point where we have um, a specific AI tools um, for the actual legal work in terms of even just generating case law. I think the, the 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 shyness in terms of developing such tools is something that the other panel, panelists have talked about in terms of copyright issues, in terms of uh, what I had, uh, I think, slightly touched on in terms of hallucination theory, because these um, AI models actually learn from what um, you feed them. And the, the, the AI information that is, I mean, the output that is from this AI tools is not actually owned by any one person because it's generative, it learns as, as it goes. And the more you interact with it, the more it retains information and 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 actually gives you um, a certain output. So I'm, I may be here to learn in terms of whether there are any specific AI tools, but in terms of just generating workflow, in terms of just aiding in, in legal operations, there are tools out there like document management systems and contract lifecycle management systems that actually reduce the time in terms of the manual process of handling these documents or in terms of um, basic review, like Brian had talked about, generating some boilerplate clauses and generating some standard format you know, documents. I think the message that we are trying to pass across, and I think I believe this is the same for all the other panelists, is that um, AI tools are not there to replace um, the hard work that you did in getting your law degree. I think what we need to understand is that it's just there to, a lot of these tools are there to um, increase efficiency and productivity and save you time. I think what we always must remember is that our training as lawyers is to continuously research and to continuously question um, um, what, what, how we are interacting with these tools and what their output is. So I do believe in the future we are going to get to a point where we are able to have tools that are specifically geared towards, uh, for example, data analytics in heavy cases, so for example, like a constitutional filing. But we are not there yet, and I think some of these issues um, have not, or some of these tools have not been, you know, adequately developed because we haven't been able to have healthy conversations in terms of even AI governance. Um, I think it was in 8th December that the EU actually passed the AI Act. It's something that is very new, and there are some conversations, healthy conversations that are still going on and some of the ethical issues that have arisen due to AI and I think these are some of the challenges that need to be phased out or, you know, considered before we actually get to a point where we are able to develop tools that are just specifically for the type of work that we need them to do. You, you made a comment that uh, uh, brings me to two questions just before I get back into the intellectual property side of things. But uh, Mr. Moses Kahoro and, uh, and, and, and Mary Okioma, um, have asked what I call a Skynet question. If anyone was watching the Terminator uh, franchise movies, I just told you how old I am. Um, it's, it's, it's a question of whether or not we can be replaced by AI in certain aspects. And, uh, and Mary asks, considering how thorough chat GPT has become as a research assistant, and the fact that the current version was created a couple of years back, how can we be so confident that the next version of chat GPT will not take up much of the work that lawyers are doing. Um, this, a similar question was uh, from Moses, who says, the critical question is consider how employers will navigate the issue of redundancy as AI increasingly handles tasks traditionally performed by human workers. For example, with AI systems capable of performing legal assistant duties faster, more accurately, and more efficient, efficiently, how will employers justify retaining human staff in this role? Maybe Ridwan, you want to go with that? Okay, um, so I mean, I think yeah, an interesting way to frame the question is um, what if you become the employee who now knows how to use or who's then responsible for using the AI tools to solve the same problem, solve traditional problems? So, again, um, of course, some the relevance of some roles will become questionable, but what it tells us more is about how to align our skill sets. 
alignment of our, our, our skill sets to to make so people like you alan for example you had like foresight to do something interesting differently which means you were able to create a path for yourself away from the traditional um legal setup right so what i simply mean is that you had like an oversight I mean, you had like a foresight to see things differently which gave you like a competitive edge and it comes back to this it's it's a sink or swim situation if you don't upskill enough where you become relevant you become the one driving these things the truth is some of these traditional things that we do that are now getting more and more automated it simply means they may not be relevant for them anymore but sorry um, so but um one thing you can take away is um one thing you can take away is the fact that um, again, we need to do more like find some sort of an alliance where we find a way to argument this. And there have been a kind of number of questions around, you know, what are the tools? So what you find increasingly is some of the traditional legal tools that you use, they are also now embedding AI into them. So it depends on where you are in the state of how much of legal tools do you use. So from tools like Lexis, Nexus, um, Thomas Reuters, um, uh, Clio, um, depending on the extent of how much of deployment you've done. And the interesting thing also these days is that even with like OpenAI, you can create your own GPT and you can train it to be what, I mean, whatever it is that you want it to do. Um, you can decide to deploy it openly, pretty much the same way you see apps listed on app stores. Um, so your traditional app developers or the traditional um, legal tools are also now embedding AI as a layer of service. Um, in Nigeria, for example, we used to have we have this very popular um, electronic law reporting tool um, called Law Pavilion, which has also now embedded AI into it um, from analysis to quick search and all of that. So, increasingly, depending on where you are in terms of AI deployment, um, we're seeing more and more traditional tools that you typically have and use helping you now embed um, AI capabilities into the tools to even be able to do uh, more than. Um, it is, there's an interesting startup here in Africa, by the way. Um, what they do mostly is around regulatory intelligence. For, for you as an in-house counsel, um, this tool is helping, you're, you're, you're making like a market access into, let's say you're going into a new market. You have zero idea about it. Before you go talk to local counsel, they will probably um, give you an interesting amount of, you know, give you an interesting invoice. Uh, and with this tool, you can actually generate a country specific report on the legal touch points that you're looking for. And they've created these touch points across different domains. So that's like something I can create. And I'm, and I'm saying something that generates a country specific report in less than a minute, once you pick the things you need to pick. So again, increasingly the traditional tools that we're using are being like AI capabilities are being built on them. So you want to check where you are currently um, who are your vendors? Who are your service providers? What kind of tools are you using? Even for email capability, if you're a firm, for example, that is deploying Google Workspace, you can decide, for example, whether you want um, Google Bad, which is now Gemini. You want it integrated into your system. Microsoft has this co-pilot that you can also use as part of the job. Again, um, you can pick low hanging fruits that can help you do like basic things. But then if you need more specific or more nuanced tool to do like the heavy lifting, there's a good chance that the traditional guys that providing that service have already leveraged or have already um, built an AI on top of these traditional tools. So you just need to know what your, um, the kind of vendors, I mean, so it doesn't look like I've been paid to sponsor any tool or service provider here. You just need to know who your traditional vendors are, then you need to see what they're doing with AI. Literally almost everyone is building AI capabilities into the traditional tools that they have. And, and um, like I said, Alan, I hope, you know, I really get like the opportunity to speak about the governance elements. Um, for us as in as council, we need to start rethinking it. It's obvious we can't stop the news, but then how do we think about disclosure? How do we think about handling liability? How do we think about handling the risk that comes with it and all of that? Thanks. Thank you, Ridwan. Um, I think there's, there's something I, I would like to, maybe Brian, um, the questions on, on, on uh, intellectual property, um, data protection and privacy, uh, when, you have, when you have AI and you use AI, um, I think this may also lead lead to the, that liability question. Um, one, um, how do you protect the information that is shared? Um, two, how do you ensure that that uh, 
the intellectual property that you use um, is not abused, so to speak. And then at the end of the day, who, who, has, who has the responsibility to ensure that AI is used responsibly? I hope I haven't overloaded your questions. I was going to Don't tell you. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. I was going to tell you those are, those are a lot of uh, questions, but they're all very relevant. Um, and what I'll do again is let me just share this. And it, it blends. You had asked me to also comment on a question that you had posed to Ahenda. Although what she said, I agree with um, entirely. But let me just add this. Okay. Uh, can you, you can see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, so on the question of liability, first of all, I think we should all clap for, for Microsoft. Um, Soleimani said that they are now, liability is something that they, they are taking on. If I didn't, um, if I haven't mischaracterized what he said, um, that we can now at least breathe a sigh of relief when we use their products. Um, and then that leads to, to you know, some sort of claim. So I don't know if I'm misquoting you, um, or my understanding was that Microsoft is standing behind its products and giving us some sort of uh, protection in that regard. But um, previously also, I think when he spoke, he talked about when you put in confidential information, when you do a search on AI, you should try and make it as generic as possible. So don't put particular, um, you know, your client details. So for example, you are researching a, a local bank, like the one that Ahenda works in. And instead of saying the name of the bank, you know, so you don't say, um, you know, NCBA is looking to do one, two, three. You say a local bank in East Africa or in Kenya. Um, you know, you use those generic terms so that it helps you. There's something else also that was mentioned about if you use, if you want to, to make your, you know, to train your own AI, whatever you feed it goes into the global, you know, it helps it learn, uh, learn more. So if you're using it to, uh, you know, you're training it on, on how to, um, I think the question was, which I can tie into this, how to review large contracts, right? Whatever you put onto that um, um, platform is then available uh, globally. Then one of the panelists talked about, you can have a closed loop. Now, what does that mean? Now, let me show you. This is on your computer when you go on GPT. You can ask it. Let me just show you here. Okay. So this is what a closed loop looks like. Um, Moses, very tongue in cheek, said that uh, lawyers need to learn how to do <laughs> command prompt. So if you use Mac, you use this, this environment, I think is called, it's a virtual environment. It's called VS Code. If you use um, uh, Windows, it's your command prompt. Now, if you want, again, remember what I said, this is you have to have a lot of time on your hands and you're willing to put in the hours to, to train it this. So what you're seeing here is um, uh, a case use where I use GPT to create a code. Now the code that you see there that it says the Python codes, those are the strings that you see, you know, you type in a script and then that script is going to tell your computer what to do. So it's not on, on GPT. So I don't want to do anything on GPT. I want to do it offline on my own computer. Now, what I was trying to do here in this case is, for example, you have a large contract. I think there was a question someone asked about, you want to review a very large contract, right? Now, I know the things I want to find from that contract. So I'm not relying on GPT, right? I want to do it on my own. But let's say it has gone through four, five, six different uh, reviews. So everyone has come with their own formatting. So there's different formattings. And what I would like to do, firstly, is I want to take the four documents. When you look at your Word document, you will see, and I know, Suleimani, I'm not attacking uh, Microsoft here, but it has its limitations when you're comparing documents, right? So you have compare and you have combine. When you review a large document, um, as sometimes in-house will do, and you've sent a document to your external, you've sent it to the counterparty, they've sent it to their lawyer. So you have six documents to look at. If you use the combined function, sometimes it doesn't um, give you the best options. But again, Suleimani, I'm not throwing casting as fashions. You, you're here. You can tell us how to do it more efficiently. So what I would do then, you get GPT to write you a code to combine them on your computer. So you're not uploading your document anywhere. You're not uploading your information anywhere. What it does, so for example, here, the environment, you can see it says legal review. If you look at the next one, you see it says legal review. Can you see where it says bash, copy code? It says Python 3 legal review. So I create a folder. That folder is called legal review. I don't want 
um, the script I'm running to be on everything, you know, to run on my entire computer. It's just one particular folder. That folder is the only one that has the documents that I want it. So you can see there you have source um, at the bottom uh, and then activate the script. Then now I go and I put in, uh, and you can ask it to teach you, you know, how to do these things, uh, you know, what, what configurations to use and so on. Um, but as I said, you need a lot of time for that. So if you're adventurous or if you really enjoy this or you want to spend your, your evenings learning a new skill, I think, you know, someone said, you know, will lawyers become um, obsolete with GPT? No, I don't think so. I think lawyers who don't use it will become obsolete, but not lawyers in it, its entirety. Lawyers who use it will become more and more efficient. The people who I see a big problem in is the data scientists. Because now I don't need to be a data scientist to do these things. I have never done a computer class in my life. I have never, when I went to school, computer was not even offered as a subject. Uh, these days it's offered, I think, to gr from grade three. So depending on what you want, if you want to become a coder, you can learn all these things, you can do it. But the easier thing to do is to simply go into the app, whatever app you use, um, use the ones that give you some protections, I've mentioned the ones that we were told will give you that protection, but never ever input confidential information. Never ever input um, information about your client or any information that, assume that if you were to redact a document or information, what would you redact? And then only put the unredacted information that you want there. So again, it's part of that learning, but if you want it to be, maybe you, in your work, you, you do this quite a lot and you really want to try and make whatever work stream easier, whether it's your formatting work stream, whether it's your review work stream, I would say start with a very precise um, task in mind that you want. So it's not in general, you wanted to do all your documents. If you use banking documents, Maybe all you're looking at is to see the termination closes. You're looking to see, um, you know, the interest closes. So there's particular things that you you want to find. You start with those things, and then you ask it to show you how to do that offline, not on the computer. So everything that you do is on. And once you finish, um, so like the one I showed you, once you finish, you close this, and it disappears. But it's always only on your computer. I, I don't know if there's a bit I haven't answered. Um, uh, Alan? Oh, no, thank you. We're going to get back to you on that one. Um, I noticed the, everyone saying that you might you might have to do coding for lawyers, thanks to you. Um, <laughs> now, um, I think we're going to have to get some questions from the floor. I, I don't know whether this is something that you did, Brian, or, or some hands were up uh, earlier. Um, maybe let me get Isabella first. And, and I noticed your hand went up a little bit earlier. Um, but I, I hope you don't mind that I delayed a little bit, but I would like to give you an opportunity to ask your question. Then we, then if you want it to go to a particular person, please specify. Thank you. Just one second. Um, Isabella, you have permission to talk. I think your microphone is muted. I don't know if Isabella Nachimera is, is listening. Um, or maybe when you're ready, please, please, please let me know. I, I will, I will get back to you. Um, Omar, Omar, um, please, please go ahead. If you can hear me. I, I hope you're not speaking with your mic muted. I, I think, I think uh, I'll also get back to you um, in a short while. If you can and you can hear me, please just uh, put your hand down and put it up again. Um, I'm now going to go to Joseph Ndahiro. Uh, if you can hear me, please unmute, ask your question, and you can direct it to somebody. Sorry, I can't. Okay, if if you can, if if you if you have a question to ask, maybe I don't know whether Joseph, you can hear me. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll... Let me start with uh, Isabella. I, I, I notice your hand is up again. Do you? Do you? Can you hear me? Please go ahead. So I think I keep. 
sorry let me let me let me do this again uh, your your network isn't very clear we might need to let's try again oh so joseph you have you have you have the floor um if you can please uh, speak louder sorry uh, uh joseph I, I i don't think we can hear you um though your the microphone is on okay so what i'll do is let me just uh, apologize um we'll, we'll we'll just ask one more question um from 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 um regarding uh, um more risk um and victor is asking brian specifically how you and how you identify and manage the reputational a relational, regulatory, and operational risks associated with the use of AI, um, and to do so, and do so with sufficient agility to keep up with the velocity of change. So it's a very eloquent question. Uh, thanks. I can take that, and I can say a question for Mary as well, uh, Victor. I'd say that is, I think it is. It behooves whoever the user is. So whether you're in-house or you're um, external, that is something that needs to be top of mind. All these issues we've talked about, whether it is accuracy of the information being provided, whether it is um, your copyright issues, whether it is um, you know different liabilities. As the user who is putting in whatever functionality I want to use AI for. And again, let's talk about AI in broad terms. Let's not talk about GPT. Um, you know, all these other functionalities you use, for example, you're out of office. Isn't that AI? You're using AI to, anytime you're out of the office between these hours and these hours and these days, let it do something automatically. It could do it when you're also in the office, so you could forget to turn it off. So when it comes to, you have to yourself look to the use. The use is very important when it comes to AI. Um, the output, who's going to use this information that I am uh, I am doing? Um, one of the things, because I have to plug in, I think I'm the only uh, external counsel here, so let me plug in. At our firm, Chipotle, okay, lot is not an advertisement. One of the things we do is legal and compliance audits. And when it comes to the compliance audits, um, especially now the IT section, these are some of the things we want to check to make sure that it's not being used, you know, say your legal department or another department is not using uh, GPT to generate uh, SLAs because you could do that. You could decide I want to create an SLA and then you simply use uh, GPT to do that for you. The software that we use and that you can use, I think what you remember when you were in university, there was a, I think it was called check, uh, Tanitin or something and it used to be used for to check for pl plagiarism and there are similar things which you can use. So who does it fall to? I would say the user. You know um, what you're using the document for. Um, if you use it for generic things, then uh, you know that's fine. Although it has really, like when I first started uh, using GPT, um, and incidentally we had, so when it, when it started, we had um, an associate with us called Boru, who was one of the testers before it went live. Um, so we, we had that opportunity to look, peek behind the window before GPT was, was unveiled and see some of the uses and some of the inaccuracies it was getting. And from then to now, there's been a lot of improvements. One of the key ones that I see, as I said, is you don't need to use plugins. So now, and I think the second one, which once they get it right, which is real-time access to the internet, for most of them, you will see that it has a cutoff point. Um, I don't know if the cutoff point has now improved, um, so usually the information it gives you is not accurate as at a particular point. But the liability and the obligation is on you. Uh, Mary had asked, why should we bother to do training um, when someone else has done it? Because as the user, your functionalities are very different from someone else. So, for example, for me, I don't want it to... To, uh, to review documents because I want to put in, you know, look at the documents yourself. What I derive more benefits from is when it comes to either extract, um, you know, highlight particular um, provisions or change the, the formatting to look like, you know, a particular or combine. So it's this administrative tasks, which you would have to, for example, for us, you'd have to give it to either a junior associate that would spend hours cleaning up a document for you, 
um, they would they might fail to put you know some of the the things together. So the use that I use it for could be very different from the use that you have. Uh, but I would say if you if you're interested in this area, just juju, check YouTube. You will always see different people who. 10 minute uh, short course on how to get it to do one thing or the other. Um, it's very easy. I used to think coding is a difficult task. It's only for you know people who either did computers or such things. I'm, I can tell you within uh, less than a week, you can know enough to make yourself sufficient. Not enough to code and do a website, but enough to use AI to do something on your documents, on your computer, on your... Uh, just dedicate that amount of time. And if not, just improve on how you're, you're doing your searches. Thank you, Alan. I hope I've answered the questions. Thank you, Brian. You know, whenever you ask a question, we have more questions. So um, stand, I think we'll just share your number for everyone to throw <laughs> questions at you. Um, Ahenda, um, I had a question for you, but I'm going to need you to also elaborate an answer you wrote in the, in the chat. Um, the, you know, there's, We've been, I've, I've seen many, many conversations about how we need to study coding. Um, but now in, in your day-to-day -day practice, the in-house council role, um, is a two questions in one. The first is, you mentioned that your cost center, um, of course, as a strategic partner, do you ever have issues with budget when it comes to, to do you have, do they give you a blank check? Or is it something where you have to work within, within or are you straight jacketed when it comes to, to technology? And then the second question is, uh, do you find um, AI and um, whatever other processes um, difficult to understand? And um, are we supposed to sort of, I won't use the word dummy, but make it simpler for lawyers, um, like some of us who, who didn't do computers, first started using computers when we were much older than, than, than grade three as I said. Um, and then while you're at it, please um, tell us more about the AI hallucinations you were writing about. Thank you. Ah, Outside okay. loading the questions. Yes, you're really loading the questions. So I, I think, um, well, first of all, we are not given a blank check. Um, even as working in a fintech organization, at the end of the day, there has to be an, a return on investment in terms of whatever technology tools you decide to deploy in the organization. There must be a return on investment in terms of OPEX and CAPEX. And that has to make sense for the size of organization you have. And it also has to make uh, sense for the business case you're going to put forward, say, for example, to your CFO. So I'll give an example. When I'm having a conversation on a CLM tool, I wouldn't, you know, just um, limit it to, to a legal use case. Can, for example, this um, CLM tool or document management system tool be used um, across the entire organization? This way, you're not only being a cost center, as I said, but also you're driving a value chain system throughout the whole organization. So I'm looking at it from an aspect of risk processes. I'm looking at it from an aspect of managing some of the governance items that you may have that may flow from the board, for example. Um, I'm looking at it from an aspect of finance. I'm looking at it from an aspect of HR. Is, is, is this PLM or document management system or AI tool that I'm presenting to the business going to derive value not just from a legal cost center perspective, but from an enterprise-wide perspective? The other question that you asked in terms of, uh, now I forget. <laughs> Uh, but I'm just going to go straight into um, AI hallucinations and what I was trying to explain. And I think it ties back to the question that was um, asked to Brian in terms of just ensuring that um, the output from the AI tools that we're using are not, um, you know, causing problems in terms of um, regulatory breaches or even just, um, you know, some issues to do with copyright. So AI is a tool that uses a um, learning model. Whatever you put into it, whatever you feed into it, it will give you an output. So hallucinations are just basically, when you think about it, just like the human mind in terms of hallucinations, just generating things that are unreal or imperceptible to the human mind. So AI in its very nature is not perfect. I think that's another point I would like to bring across. Um, the AI tools do make mistakes. And I think the point that the other panelists have been trying to make is that you must govern the AI, the AI tool as you use it by 
being very careful um, with the information that you consume from it and the in information you put into it. So um, hallucinations are that some of the issues that come up in terms of the ethics. And um, I think I referred to the AI Act in the charts that some of the issues that have been generating a lot of um, heated debate and conversation is just how are we able to govern the AI tools to make sure that in as much as they, they are efficient, they are not harmful in the way that we use them. Um, sorry, Alan, you might have to remind me the other question, but I hope I've answered them um, adequately. How do we simplify um, the AI in its use? Uh, okay, um, I think that's a broad question. We may need another webinar for that, but I think one of the main things is I encourage um, I encourage people to be curious about AI. I mean, there's a lot of resources on the internet. One of the best ways to, to teach yourself how to use them is to interact with them. So instead of shying away from them and being afraid, um, afraid of using them, just you know, interact with them. Um, I, I have interacted with a few of the uh, language models, but Google Bird, Microsoft Copilot, uh, ChatGPT, and ChatGPT now, like I think it was Brian O'Reilly who said that some of the plugins are actually on the on the on the paid version of, of the tool. So if you use GPT-4, you're able to just interact with it. Um, I think that is a first question, be first point rather, be curious and 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 just interact with the tools and see how best they can serve you. I think that's my my initial advice. Be curious in terms of how you use them. Be curious in terms of also how um, maybe other organizations have used them. I know for, for a fact that after this webinar, I'm going to be hitting a brand to figure out how to start coding. But I think being curious is the very first uh, initial step. Uh, maybe the other panelists may, may have uh, some more ideas in terms of just how to simplify, but I think learning and being curious, you just have to dive in and, and, and just you know get your hands dirty, so to speak, to be able to realize the value that they, you can derive from them. Thank you very much. And, and while we're talking about uh, calling and asking for help, I'm going to try and open the floor again, but this time I'm going to ask the Secretariat to manage that part where you let guys in to speak. Uh, Brenna, if you can. Uh, okay. I see Isabella's hand is still up uh, and, and it's been up for a while. I feel like I, I, uh, I shouldn't be doing this, but we should, we should let her speak and ask a question. I hope you're ready, Isabella and Omar. So, so. Uh, Brenna, please help with Isabella, especially, or anybody. She has the right to speak now. Kindly unmute Isabella. If you can hear us, please unmute. I hope you're not speaking to a muted mic, Isabella, or, or, or is this a... A hand that was up earlier. Um, would we go to Adeola? She sure. can't please unmute and speak. I'd like to open the floor up floor to any questions if you really want to ask the question. Um, um, you could ask us, we'll unmute you and we'll get, uh, we'll get you in. Uh, maybe as a wait for Isabella, Alan, Alan Baguma, please go ahead and mute him. Uh, uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, first of all, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right. Uh, so le let me try to give a practical example of my day-to-day use of legal tools. So, I mean, well, familiar with the, the practical laws and the Thompson routers of this world. Uh, I've always been curious as to whether there has been any instance, to the best of your knowledge, where someone who has a subscription, let's say with Thompson routers or with LexisNexis, can actually get for instance, an AI tool, uh, and then I guess somewhere in the back end, enable it to connect to like the databases of uh, of uh, of Thomson Reuters or of LexisNexis, so that in essence you create a kind of virtual assistant. If I want to say get some quick research on, let's say, 
an international law topic that I'm dealing with, I simply use this AI tool that is connected to this database like Thomson Reuters to get the information I need. I don't know if that is something any of you has come across or can comment on. Thank you. So the money meant to take this. Sure, thanks. Um, so there are different, so obviously as, as AI becomes more, um, generative AI becomes more um, in vogue, people are are integrating AI increasingly into their products and services. So a lot of the um, learning platforms, document management systems, legal databases, et cetera, are already, already using some form of artificial intelligence, but increasingly we will see them incorporating generative AI capabilities um, into their platforms. So it, it the short answer to your question is for, for, for other platforms, it depends on whether those platforms have the ability to integrate um, AI into, into their systems or depending on the type of information you're seeking, um, especially with with the with the platforms that have the ability to um, you know query resources in real time, if you have the ability to generate the right sort of prompt um, with the right data set, you could um, be able to do that. On the flip side, internally, like for example, for us at Microsoft, we allow you to have um, we we allow you to use our systems to use our capabilities, but based on your data set, right? So if you have uh, a data set that is only on, to make it very simple, only on your device or only on your servers and it contains a number of judgments, a number of court decisions, orders, et cetera, you would be able to use our system to generate specific responses based on the prompts that you feed it. Now, generally for you know, other um, legal databases, et cetera, it's dependent on whether that database has integrated its ability or if you're using the right sort of um, um, AI, AI system to be able to uh, utilize it. And for the benefit of, of uh, individuals who want some learning resources, I've just dropped in the uh, general chat a link to Microsoft Learn. You can log in. Uh, and get free access to a number of uh, training resources, including on artificial intelligence, uh, but on a host of all other things. And some of those resources are, are free. And for some of them, you can actually even get uh, certifications for your skill, for the skills that you learn. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Soleimani. Uh, um, any other questions? I, I noticed uh... Adiola, Isabella, you still, you still, uh, you still have the floor. Um, Adiola, if you, if you still have a question, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alan, and thank you to all the facilitators. I've really enjoyed listening to this. Uh, I just stumbled on this webinar on Alan's page, so I'm really excited that I got to, to listen in. And I think one of the questions that I've always I've always wondered about has to do with the relationship between in-house and external counsel when it comes to AI use. So on the one hand, I know that there might be some, there will be some level of investment in AI in making work easier. Um, but in the end, it makes work faster. And then I expect that that should then also translate to cheaper um, invoices to help my own billing as an in-house or general counsel. Am I being unreasonable and unrealistic with that? Or what should we expect? How do we balance when you use AI? And then how much should I demand my external counsel to tell me and be transparent regarding their use of AI in the work that they generate for us. Thank you. 
Th thank you, Adela. It's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, could I get, okay, a hand up. I, I wanted an in-house counsel and then Brian, who's, who's the, the external counsel representative here. Um, maybe both of you can take a crack at this. Um, um, <laughs> actually, when I had the question from Adiola, I sort of had a feeling it was going to come to me uh, initially because I've been talking about efficiency and productivity and also just not viewing the legal function as a cost center. So thank you very much, Adiola, for that question. I think it's very relevant now and also for the future in terms of um, being able to derive um, value and not just value from a commercial or revenue perspective, but also from, um, I think, an, an, a learning and engagement perspective when we think about um, the interactions we have with external counsel. So I think we are getting to the age where the per billing, um, per hour billing is going to diminish and we will need to continue having productive conversations with our external counsel just to not only be able to build capacity for in-house counsel and extend that capacity where that capacity may not be available in-house, but also to derive some sense of, I think, um, collaboration between us and external counsel. So one of the tools that um, we, we use in-house uh, is that we continuously generate milestone-based, or we are thinking about generating milestone-based type of SLAs with our external counsel. Um, and that may require some level of uh, data analytics and might require some level of um, output in terms of data. And not just data in terms of, you know, like um, output in terms of just contracts, but actual um, data, scientific data in terms of just how much work has been done, how much more work needs to be done, and what are you billing me fairly, I think is the question that you're trying to drive at. So I think AI tools can help in terms of generating that sort of scientific data that will help um, having those conversations very productively, both in-house and externally. And also just um, continuously driving conversations towards collaboration um, instead of just having um, fee notes just issued or just instructions issued. I think we need to con continuously think about deepening the relationship between internal and external counsel because uh, we are not only um, colleagues in the profession, but we also need to continue deriving value or driving value for the various um, business centers that we sit in. I think that's that's how I would approach this um, this um, discussion. Brian, over to you. <laughs> just, just a small twist. Just a small twist before you come in, Brian. Um, yeah. You know that the in-house counsel's goal, single purpose in life, is to kill the billable hour. Yes. Um, and the, and the question of how a lawyer's skill and time are his stock in trade he said no 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 no. how much money you bring back to the company is so mm. in terms of the 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 need for the in-house counsel's um, efficiency for external counsel to be efficient in the eyes of the in-house counsel and save them money and then the external counsel's need to meet their financial targets uh, through the billable hour there's a clash there can ai um is ai going to help or hurt um each one of them I, 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 before, I think okay, so, but I think it, it's a fair question because, I mean, I, I don't know how many in-house counsel are on the panel, but I think it's continuously becoming um, a healthy KPI for external counsel to, to track how much they're spending with their external partners. And the, the truth is we cannot completely do away with that relationship, but I think what we need to do is just um, drive efficiency in that collaboration and continuously derive value from it. So that's why we're talking about the billable hour, but what other value add services can external counsel provide? I mean, Brian has literally shown us that he can code. So <laughs> maybe one of the, 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 the conversations or some of the conversations we need to be having with our external counsel is just, you know, driving that data using AI and, and showing that value from a, from a bottom line perspective, not just on fee note, but actually, you know, getting some way to produce work that is not just tied to a fee note, but even just in terms of um, deriving data in terms of volume, uh, deriving data in terms of information and, and just um, other value add services. Thank you, uh, Brian, I, I, it just got uh, harder. Yeah, but I want to associate myself wholly with what, what uh, Ahenda has said. And Adeola, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, 
I, I must start by saying I noted that you said you happened to to stumble upon this um, webinar. So your the CPD attendance, I'll uh, just give you my billing um, instructions. So that if you don't <laughs> get, ELS at least. <laughs> but I think so it's a very good question. And if you think if you go back again, so let's again let's move away from from AI and thinking of AI simply as GPT. AI has already brought a lot of uh, benefits to in-house counsel. You'll remember pre-COVID, most of the meetings, and this is a, a huge cost to some of the briefs that we do, is the number of meetings that you have, you know, to review documents and so on. Pre-COVID, almost every meeting or every everything used to be physical, right? Post COVID, um, and at least we invested in in a number of, of AI tools, a number of because AI is simply artificial intelligence, right? That enabled us to have these meetings virtually. If you're a client, for example, that has 30, 40 branches, bringing all those people together, or bringing their heads together to have a meeting with your legal counsel is expensive. If you're in a regional office, uh, you want to have a you know a discussion with your counsel. It helps if they have some form of AI. Now, it could be as simple as Teams, as Zoom, but that is a form of AI. So it already makes um, things cheaper for you. Ahenda talked about um, moving away from the billable hours. Um, again, another thing that AI has done, again, if we move away from GPT, is when you do due diligence or you do your, your audits, a huge part of the time component that's used and the resources is attending offices to go through bulky documents, right? So most organizations now have, and especially you'll find this, I think almost every organization does this at board level at least. Everything for the board is always digital. When it comes to the rest of the organization now, we have a few, um, you know, we, we, we struggle here and there, but for the board, everything is, is digital. What does that mean? It means it's cheaper for you to do a compliance audit. It's cheaper for you to have a governance audit. It's cheaper for you to have um, the DD done because you've already organized your documents. So on your end, you can also already streamline some of these processes to make it cheaper for when in-house, um, rather when, when external counsel come. Now, so that's, so the creation of virtual data rooms, um, the, the big thing is on your indexing, on your question on disclosures, I think that's very important. Um, we will always tell you these are the AI tools that we, we utilize. Um, and we don't use GPT for work. We use the different AI tools. As I said, so for example, we have a tool that enables us to um, draft documents a lot faster. This is when you're doing your SLAs, right? So you don't need to input. Once you have the your template documents and you have the, um, you know, the, the regulations, you have everything input, it then becomes easier to churn them out. Now, should you have that benefit in terms of should I charge you less because I'm doing it faster? It's there's both there's two sides to it because it's an investment on my part, and I need to at least do uh, X number of of transactions for that cost to come back. I'm not looking to, uh, as clients will often say, to buy a Ferrari from, you know, this particular brief. So we're not looking to bill enough to pay for this. But clients must also, and in house, you must also take into consideration that there has been a cost to put in these things. And I think um, um, someone talked earlier about even for the GPT types, even for those software types, there's a cost um, involved in doing this. So I make it faster for you. I make it uh, slightly cheaper, but that doesn't mean that you don't pay a premium. There must be a slight premium that is paid for this, at least for the short term. In my view, in the next six, uh, maximum six years, it, it will become almost the norm. So there'll be a number of, of um, tools that are used across the board by, by everyone. Um, so the benefit that you will have, time, that's definite. Uh, costing slightly, but I would say also there's things that you can do yourself to, to, um, you know, to make the process cheaper. Thanks, thanks, Alan. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, thankfully, we don't seem to have many clashes between in-house counsel and external counsel in this one. I'm glad you're on the same page. Um, I, I don't think it would be fair for us to leave without Isabella saying something. Um, you've had your hand up, you know, longer than anyone else. I hope you can hear us. Um, I'm going to ask you to unmute again um, and speak. Uh, I don't know whether, Brenna, you can help. Um, but uh, if, if you can still hear us, you could ask the question at any point. And uh, we've gotten to 15 minutes to the end. 
um, and and I'm having a lot of fun, but uh, I have to make sure that you know um, we, we were only given till four. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, um, a question that probably everyone should be able to answer. And if you have some closing remarks, um, I'll just keep going from from one end of the of the of, of the, the my screen to the other. So um, one um, is AI uh, here to stay. Do you see a future with it? And what 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 predictions do you have um, for AI, especially with regard to 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 legal practice and general use? Um, I notice my, my father still goes to the bank whenever he wants to do something. Um, I haven't been in a banking hall for more than a year. Um, but then that, that's a clear distinction in generations. And I'm wondering whether the next generation, because of course the generation after me, is, is even going to have a bank account. Um, so do you think, what, what, what future do you think um, AI is going to play in our practice and our lives? Um, and what should we look out for? Uh, but I'd also like some closing remarks and anything you want us to, to take away from this um, in your thoughts. So I'll give each one, you know, um, like four minutes or so before, before we say thank you. So we'll start with Salamani. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Um, just before I end, I just would like to say, you know, particularly for, for uh, in-house in counsel, um, we are seeing as as Microsoft as a as a company that also engages uh, external counsel, huge efficiency uh, returns, particularly for repetitive tasks, as I think uh, Brian had mentioned. But conversely, um, we are also seeing um, a lot of appetite for cross-functional experiences. So lawyers who have multiple skills in uh, different fields, and then also really, really, really deep, you know, high level analysis of, of, of data. I think those are some of the opportunities that I think um, the introduction of artificial intelligence is going to create for the, for the legal landscape. But to your, to your core question, you know, is AI here to say, I would say absolutely. Um, it is changing, generative AI particularly has changed humanity forever. I don't think we are going to go back um, to, to what things were, you know, pre, pre-pandemic and then subsequently this new digital age that, that we live in. And if you if you look at, you know, uh, toddlers and young kids, the way they engage with technology, you know, it's 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 very different to anything that that we've seen for a very long time. And I think really the appeal from from everyone else is to lean in and, and embrace um, these technologies, um, I think there's a huge opportunity, a massive opportunity for, for us from the region and, and, and on the continent generally, because for the first time, we are kind of all starting at the same level. Everyone, everyone has the ability to, to skill up um, when it comes to understanding, you know, generative AI, AI broadly and, and, and technology. And so, you know, people can develop um, areas of deep specialization. Um, firms that embrace technology and artificial intelligence use will definitely be more efficient and they will be more sought after um, by, by, by clients. And so I think um, my, my appeal there is, is for everyone to embrace this change, uh, to take it in. Uh, there will be some disruptions that will take place but overall, I think a lot of the data is showing us that there'll be more benefits um, than there will be uh, challenges. And so, you know, people are talking about, um, you know, the fourth industrial revolution. I think this is this is a revolution within a revolution um, that's taking that's taking place. And 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 so definitely, I think for for the East African region um, and for the world globally, we have a huge opportunity uh, to. Um, maximize on this uh, artificial intelligence inflection moment um, and to make good use of it um, in, in the work that we do as lawyers, as practitioners, but also to use it. I think something that sort of came out in the course of our conversation, let's not let's remember sometimes as lawyers, we are very focused on, on the bubble that, that we operate in, 
these technologies also have broader socioeconomic and political um, dimensions to them, right? Um, and so how these technologies are used, the type of regulations that are put in place should also enable societal development, um, should also and it should also be done in a manner that uh, safeguards uh, the technology from uh, improper use by actors. Um, and with that, I will close. And thank you very much to, to the organizers once again for um, inviting uh, us to be here today. Thanks. Thank you very much, Salmani. Maybe we'll go on to Brian. Any parting shots and uh, the future. Okay, thanks. Um, so there was a very, a very uh, one of my the things I'm taking away is a line I had said about um, the AI hallucinations. I quite like that. I'm going to use that. Um, I hope there's no copyright on that. Um, there's a question that keeps recurring, and I want this to be one of the parting shots. Will AI make lawyers obsolete? No. In my view, it's a it's it's an emphatic no. But AI will distinguish us. So AI. The lawyers who use it are the lawyers who are going to succeed in the future. Uh, but those who don't use it, it's not that they will be out of practice, but um, uh, they will not do as well as those who do. For in house, I would say use AI tools um, and ask your external counsel what AI tools they utilize so that you can get the best of it. And so that you can also know the dangers um, that may be implied in the practice um, and in their operations. Um, I would say, just the same way that uh, there was a technology leap in the early, the mid nineties, where um, as a region, we moved straight from having, um, you know, the call boxes to cell phones. This AI revolution is also a great equalizer. It means that we can move at the same pace as the rest of the world. There is, we don't have uh, a situation where we're being, East Africa has been left behind and we have to wait for other regions. Um, although I had said that for lawyers, do not preoccupy yourself with, with bringing tools, um, you know, specific tools for this, but I expect other people to be doing it. I don't know which regions you come from, but in Kenya, you will have seen, and this may be the case across East Africa, every now and then people will come up with an app that can either do, uh, you know, you can apply for or check what are the, the driving offenses. Someone has, some governments, you know, say you will have to do certain services through, you know, a digital platform. So slowly and slowly throughout the region, we are going to utilize AI a lot more often. We joked about coding and about whether it will be an essential skill. And I, and I remember when I was in law school, we, we had to do um, a training on how to use LexisNexis more efficiently. Now, I'm told, I do not know this, I take it on authority from those who have children of, of going to school age, that kids these days are being taught how to code as it is. Now, what happens when they move from grade six, they go to university, they come to the workforce, they want to be lawyers. It means that they already have, you know, something that for us was, you know, was a plus or something we didn't even consider. It's going to be, um, you know, the standard for everyone. So as I said, I think it will then distinguish you know, the lawyers who know how to use AI efficiently. Um, and finally, to say, we are happy to have a lot of these discussions. Um, there were some questions that we were not able to, to, um, to take. As I said, at, at Triple OK Law, we have invested a lot in technology. And we started this prior to, to um, you know, the pandemic. Some of those benefits we are starting to reap um, now. We are seeing a lot more firms doing a lot of the things that we put in a very long time ago. Um, but I would say AI is here to stay. You either get on board or you get obsolete. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Brian. Ahenda, over to you. Uh, so thank you. Um, the dangers of speaking after Brian is that uh, you're not quite sure where, where to come in, but I think I will um, I will agree with him. I do agree that AI is here to stay. And let me step out of my you know in-house counsel hat for a bit and, and, and just speak a little bit about policy development. Like um, very much like we saw the evolution of uh, data protection uh, laws and governance uh, across East Africa and and the rest of Africa. I think the next stage in, in when we're speaking about AI is AI governance. Um, I think that is something that we all need to get involved in. 
Um, I'll also switch a little bit to financial services, which is something I'm passionate about and I've spoken about quite a bit. I think AI is going to be the thing that drives um, financial services and will drive financial inclusion much deeper than it is today in the next 10 or 15 years. Um, when you have uh, futuristic apps uh, like Loop, shameless plug there, um, I think AI is what is going to drive um, the next frontier in terms of financial inclusion. So I do not think that AI is something that we can ignore. It will be in our face, like Brian said, it will lead to the next um, generation in terms of what we are able to do as Africans and globally. Um, I think about smart contract evolution and blockchain integration, where we might be able to see some level of digital KYC being instantaneous. And that would also lead regulators to think about the current um, you know, applicability of the laws we have today. And I think um, as a parting shot, I think um, AI is here to stay, like I said. Um, AI as tools are facilitators, but not replacement for legal expertise. So like I said, um, I'm, I'm encouraging everyone who's on, on, on this um, webinar to just get curious and, and, and stretch your mind in terms of what is possible and in terms of going beyond what is possible is what do you think are some of the issues? Because some of the conversations that we are driving are actually what is going to impact the future in terms of how we interact with these tools and how useful they are for us uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. Thank you very much to ELS for having us on this really wonderful conversation and I'm looking forward to some more. Thank you very much. Um, I think Ridwan is the last. Yeah, I mean, uh, thanks. I totally forgot. <laughs> but yeah, um, for me, I mean, the key thing I'd really like to talk about is, you know, beyond us trying to get a grasp of how things work technically, is also how to start thinking about what does this really mean for us, even in our capacity, because it simply means um, the current scope of our roles are expanding. So think about it. Um, over a decade ago, many of us were just, even for those who probably work in house, um, had to deal with just traditional problems. Um, but now, on, on the different spectrum, now you're dealing with um, traditional problem, but then in digital context. So you have data protection laws, you have consumer protection laws, you have competition laws, which have, which all of these laws have like some sort of like a big digital implication. And it's pretty much the same with AI. And if you're thinking about this for in your capacity as an in-house person, it simply means first you need to upskill to be able to be able to, to address um, this new challenge. But it's also like a call to action. The skill sets that we need to get into the space two years ago, it's different from what you need right now. So we are all evolving. You know, on one hand, you have like data protection as a pain point. You're lucky if you have a budget to hire someone specifically for that role. But now we're dealing with a different brand which means we need people with specific skill sets, or maybe we have to then upskill to be able to deal with these problems. And for me, working with so many companies building AI solution, um, my advice is always around, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You already, some of you already have security programs established, you have privacy programs established, just build on what you have already. What are the principles you want to run with? Because of course, there is no AI specific laws that we have in this side of our world. What is your ethics? You need to define these things. Um, so, there are a whole bunch of AI issues that are arising from the existing compliance pain points that we have, data protection, um, um, consumer protection, competition law. I talk about those three domains because they are super important. Um, then employee training is always going to be very important. Um, we need to train people So 
something has come from AI. Um, you also want to worry about employees to try to like put in policies to say, you know what, you can just generate. So we're saying it's almost practically impossible to do that. So policies, policies, I mean, policies that needs to be operationalized. Not using it, you must also be able to disclose around um, personal data can go to the environment. And all of us to worry about the output of generating AI. I'm not sure, that's not possible. So, um, worrying is the manager of what Microsoft is doing, there are quite a number of Finally, um, you also want to think about things like creating a set of ability that affects real guards. You're thinking about new things like algorithm of AI, record of AI activities as well. So we need to evolve and it also means our role, there's a shift shifting in our capacity and, uh, and the existing role that we have. Thank you so much for your uh, Thank you very much. Um, I, I think we were getting very comfortable here and this probably could have gone on much longer, but uh, unfortunately we've run out of time. Um, for those who weren't able to get their questions in, we apologize. Um, we will be happy to get emails, you know, to get ELS. We can always get back to you with some answers. I'm told the presentations will be shared. Um, and uh, I think this, this, to me, this afternoon is what happens when you get a, a phenomenal panel, as, as Brenna called them, um, and meeting a very, a very engaged and wonderful um, audience. We thank you for making my work very easy because you asked all the questions. Um, and uh, for all the answers that came in, um, we've been challenged. Um, we're going to be learning a lot more in terms of the coding and numbers. And I think uh, we'll, we'll grow a lot more. Um, but uh, considering that we've done this, 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 this uh, webinar um, on Zoom, um, we could have gotten into planes and flown to one place. Um, I think technology is here to stay. Thank you for your time, um, both, both the panelists uh, who came and shared their wisdom with us. And thank you very much to, to, to the audience for being such a great audience. Um, please uh, look out for more um, of these. Uh, we're grateful to East African Law Society for providing a platform for us to share and learn and grow. And I think uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look out for a lot more. Um, a few other people we want to thank behind the scenes, Brenna, um, Gabriel, Gloria, um, they start the ELS team. Uh, which 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 worked tirelessly to get this sorted out. Um, thank you very much. So for me, I'll say good evening. We're two minutes over. Um, thank you for your time and enjoy your day. Thanks a lot.